So Strand looked at me and he said, you should write about all this someday. And I said, do you mean about all the terrible privations and wrenching traumas from my childhood? And he said, yes, it would be hilarious. And I said, you mean nonfiction? And well, here we are some 40 years later at the nonfiction at the food court reading series. Tonight, taking refuge from the metaphysical nausea and dislocation out there, we consecrate this food court in the name of nonfiction. Tonight, we exalt and exult in the credible in here. And before I get started here, I'd just like to second my mom's words of gratitude for Jenny Chernalls, the senior general manager at Wood Creek Plaza Mall, who, as my mom said, worked so diligently and without whom none of this would be possible. I don't know if it has anything to do with the heavy rain or the flash flood warnings or the possibility of mall shooters or what, but I'm sorry she couldn't be here tonight. And, uh, you know something? If perhaps, and I'm just thinking out loud here, Jenny Schoenhalls is not here tonight because she's become disillusioned by the material world and renounced it, including her family and her profession. And she's taken a vow of silence and itinerant solitude and set out to walk across the country barefoot, living off alms, chanting and praying. If she's shaved her head and wears a mask over her mouth to avoid inadvertently ingesting insects, if she's chosen to do that, then I say, right on, Jenny. You fucking go, girl. If she's abjured the food court in her anorexia mirabilis, then I say, bravo, bravissimo. And I dedicate this reading to you. You strike a heavy blow, martyr, in your death fast. And we hope that the glow of your starving, autophagic body signals the serrated nano UFOs to descend from space and tunnel into the aorters and urethras of all the terrible men who've turned me down for jobs all my life, my whole life. These men I've had to pander to, to try and ingratiate myself with over all these years, all you hitherto imaginary, sausage-shaped, GPS-guided, sodomizing necrodrones. By the power of Satan, I command you! Hurdle down from outer space and bury yourselves in the assholes of all the men who've made me grovel for crumbs and work for scale. These are the same kinds of men that my mom so eloquently denounced in her introduction. So condescending, so dismissive and smug. My mom swore at them. Remember? Remember when she was describing how she reviled them? How she spat at them when they returned in their fishing boats and their ships? Now hold on, hold on. Mark motions for quiet as if to quell a stir his remarks have provoked, which they have not. We're all adults here. We all know the score. We know what they do to people like me and my mom. To paradoxical hybrids of arrogant narcissism and vulnerable naivete. We know what happens to unreconstructed surrealist militants. Tortured. Marked for assassination. Imagine what awaits me out there. In the thrall of biological determinism and acculturation we're left very little wiggle room. We now know, 
and didn't back then in 1973 when Strand and I sat in his office casually discussing cestinas and ekphrasis. That genetic variations in brain morphology, weight, age, diet, alcohol, drug and tobacco use, toxic exposure, exercise routines, etc. have more to do with a writer's style than the comics he read when he was young. In 1955, the year my mom was pregnant with me, Bertolt Brecht voted Mao Zedong's essay on contradiction the best book he had read in the past 12 months, a period of time that saw the publication of William Golding's Lord of the Flies, Kingsley Amos's Lucky Jim, Sloan Wilson's The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, and Dr. Zeus's Horton Here's a Who, Mao. A guy who never brushed his teeth, who just rinsed his mouth out with tea when he woke up, who, according to his personal physician, Lee Zizhu, never cleaned his genitals. Instead, Mao said, I wash myself inside the bodies of my women. The imaginary intern and I were great admirers of Mao's talks at the Yan'an Forum on Literature and Art, and we diligently tried to apply his dictum, discard what is backward and develop what is revolutionary to the production of Gone with the Mind, and although I agree with Mao that one should bathe infrequently and that when, when one does, one should use the vaginal flora of other creatures instead of soap, I sus subscribe unswervingly to the conviction that a gentleman should never go out in public at night without pomaded hair and heavy cologne. Mark cocks his head to one side as if he hears in the sudden cascade of hail against the skylight. The siren song of death itself. In hindsight, I think probably the most significant thing about the fighter jet cycle is how the multicolored gunfire spewing from the fighter jets in those early crayon drawings resembled a kind of weaponized vomit. Obviously, an allusion to my mom's hypermesis gravidarum, which she'd eventually sublimate into her logoria. And also, and this is another one of those things that just occurred to me in the car on the way here tonight, how those fighter jets so clearly presaged the motif of Mussolini's flying balcony and gone with the mind. Now, the Bethesda blowjobs were a series of blowjobs I received in the late 70s in a car parked in a lot outside a large office complex in Rockville, Maryland. Why my mom and I came to refer to them as the Bethesda blowjobs, I really can't say. The person giving me the blowjobs was a woman who was my boss, my supervisor at the time. And she was a particularly... Intelligent, very precise, very punctilious kind of person, actually a very imposing person. And I remember thinking at the time that here was a sort of grand dame in the making. This basically all came about because I shared a tiny little office with this very nebbishy, sallow, stoop-shouldered, middle-aged guy whose name I can't remember at the moment. This was a document analysis company that was used primarily by law firms involved in very complex litigation like huge class action suits, for instance, where there'd be massive amounts of documentation like reports and memoranda and correspondence and interviews and interrogatories that all needed to be collated and synopsized and classified or coded. So anyway, this unfortunate guy I shared the office with was just an especially unprepossessing, awkward, and excruciatingly goofy, completely uncool person who was effectively shunned by everyone and who didn't have a single friend, a single person to even talk to in the entire office. And I think he'd just undergone some pretty serious gastrointestinal surgery because after his lunch, his stomach would start rumbling. I mean, seriously, rumbling. He'd get this, you know, what's the medical term? This, uh, this boar boar Igmus. He'd get this Borborigmus like I'd never heard in my life. 
It was like the shifting of tectonic plates or something. And then there'd be this whistling sound, this high-pitched sibilance, like there was some kind of pressurized internal leak in there. And then he'd fall dead asleep sitting in his chair for quite a while, for like an hour, hour and a half. And for whatever reason, I honestly can't say, I developed this keen affection for him. He was actually the only person in that entire office that I felt at all comfortable with. I really felt a genuine kindredness with him. And when he'd fall asleep, I'd code his quota of documents for him. And I remember thinking one afternoon, as he was snoring and drooling on himself at his desk, that maybe this was my act of atonement for having swindled all the bright Crayolas from that colorblind boy back in the second grave at James F. Murray, number 38, elementary school. Anyway, late one afternoon as I was about, as I was about to head home, my boss, our boss, pulled me aside and said that she was attracted to me because I'd, quote, befriended a misfit, end of quote, to use her exact words, which I thought sounded like something out of one of those fantasy novels, like I'd betrothed a gnome or something. And she told me that I deserved a merit badge for it, which is such a particularly funny, particularly uncanny thing for her to have said, because when I was about eight years old and I was a Cub Scout, all the boys in our den were sitting around in the kitchen of our den mother one afternoon. And she lit a cigarette bending over the flame from the front burner on the stove and she set her hair on fire and I put it out. I don't remember if I just smothered it with my hands or doused it with some Sprite or what. But she stared at me with a sort of demented look of gratitude on her face. She drank. And she said, I'm going to recommend that you get a merit badge for this. And sure enough, I did. I actually got a merit badge for extinguishing the fire in our den mother's hair. <laughs>